Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. One of the first places I had earmarked for learning about business in Kenya was the iHub. From reading up on business in East Africa, it was always mentioned as the heart of the tech scene, not only in Kenya, but for the whole region. In fact, when rumours leaked that I'd be interviewing Kamal for this podcast, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg made sure to drop in for a visit when he was in Africa in late July. In this episode, Kamal and I discussed the government's role in fostering scalable businesses across East Africa, what makes a good pitch, and the areas of growth that he sees in the Kenyan economy. It's a very interesting conversation that we have, and so I do hope you enjoy. So I'm here today with Kamal from IHUB. Kamal, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam, and welcome to Nairobi. So uh, just to get us started, could you tell us a bit about you and a bit about IHUB, please? Uh, sure. I'm uh, the CEO of IHUB. I um, have a long history with um, IBM. I've been um, an IBMer for almost 17 years, um, and the majority of my time I was in the IBM Research Organization. I've uh, worked on four different continents, um, and um, after I had uh, left IBM, I was inclined to take a year of sort of rethinking about what I wanted to do. Um, always focused on the growth markets, emerging markets, um, and I, I had a few folks, Eric Hersman and uh, others from, you know, who were part of the IHUB and the tech community here in Nairobi, who very quickly <clears throat> reached out to me and sort of asked me, hey, can you help with the IHUB? We're going through a transformation. We want to do a new start and sort of a new beginning for the IHUB. Um, and so I signed up for it. And, uh, it's been a really interesting um, interesting few months um, in this job. Um, just to give you a sense of what the IHUB is, um, and let me kind of start a little bit with the history of it. Um, the IHUB was founded now about six years ago, and the goal initially was to just be a place, a physical space for people who are interested in technology, who are interested in blogging about technology or about any other things related to this, um, to come together. And um, the IHUB has turned into much more than just that. So, of course, it's a co-creation workspace as well. But we have an incubation um, center. We, you know, tended to do things like research about the importance of ICT in this environment. We spend um, a lot of time developing a consultancy service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we've been... We've been kind of developing into an organization which was there to support the community, the tech community specifically in Kenya. And by doing so, I think it's fair to say that almost every entrepreneur in the tech space here in, in Kenya has at some point come through the island. Not that we claim success for every single entrepreneur here. Uh, in Kenya, but I think everyone at some point has attended meetings here or sat here for a while, or of course, um, some of them were also incubated here for some. So I think um, the, the 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 really important thing about the IHUB is uh, that it has developed into this national treasure of Kenya, the, the, the symbol of what makes Kenya special from a technology perspective and. So what I have inherited is an organization that has a substantial global brand and represents who we are in Kenya as one of the most successful and also advanced uh, tech ecosystems in all of Africa. Yeah, so just so I got it right, um, it started off as a sort of co-working space and then since then it has grown with different arms um, such as consulting, uh, incubation, et cetera. Is, is that roughly about right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, which of those arms or, or the center, which of those is growing most at the moment? Well, you know, for me, the, the important thing in this strategic transformation is to, um, <clears throat> to kind of understand 
uh, two things. So one is, of course, to put the IHAP also onto firm business footing which, you know, is not something we talk too much about, right? Make sure we have the proper accounting and make sure that, you know, we don't spend more than we than we generate as income. Um, so that's, I think, one part of an exercise, which is, I would say, basic business hygiene. The second part of the exercise is a little bit more tricky, which is, how do I transform into a successful organization that provides the most value um, to those who we care about, which is the community, which is the, the, the tech community in Kenya uh, that hasn't changed, but how do we do this better than what we are doing today? Um, as I, uh, you know, one, one of the things is the I have is a very demand driven community. So we have people just like yourself, by the way, right, who come to us and say, we want to know something about what you're doing or we want to help invest into something that you're doing or I just want to be part of what you're doing. Um, we've never been sort of outgoing to people and say, this is what we are offering because this is not the way how we were structured. So the other part of me um, is trying to drive a strategic shift in the IHA um, without losing our core identity without losing um, the importance that we have to the community. And um, and so for me, the strategic transformation is, can we be better at what we are doing today? Uh, can we not just become, sort of be this, this global brand and icon, um, but can we substantiate them by measuring ourselves against how many startups did we make investable? How many people did we help to become more marketable, for example, for the private sector or for other startups? Um, how have we influenced governance-related issues that are hampering the growth of the industry? How much convening power have we developed um, for global organizations, for example, to think about us first when they want to enter the market, especially the entrepreneurial market. So what my vision for the future of the IHUB is, is to be that, that center that is part movement, but also part an attractor for business and a generator for business. And um, just so I can get the sort of, um, sort of scale of things, so roughly how many people come to IHUB each day and how many uh, startups are sort of active? Um, see, that's, that's actually a good question because I can't give you a really concrete answer, right? Uh, which tells you something about us. Um, we, we have sort of a vague kind of a membership structure, which we are changing now as well, um, to be able to actually answer these questions better. However, I can tell you that on average every day we have 50 people upstairs in our co-working space. Um, we, we have, I think, about 10 people who we are incubating, 10 organizations, I think, that we are incubating. Um, and then there are startups that are just resident up there in the book space um, sort of on a regular basis. So, so um, the, but it's a, you know, comparatively speaking, it's a fairly substantive number, right? Um, uh, just if you think of, you have every day about 70 people in, in the, the co-working spaces or in the spaces that are dedicated to this. Um, and as you can see upstairs, it's always packed. Right? It's, uh, and um, this might be difficult to answer, but um, roughly, you know, what type of, of startups are, are coming here? Are you finding that there's a particular industry that's coming here, or, or do they share any common traits? Well, I would say that, um, you know, that's kind of very consistent with the, um, the broader trend in Kenya, right? So the two areas that are growing the fastest are agribusiness and fintech. Fintech, of course, we, um, we, we have a history, um, also with the PESA in, in Kenya. Um, but we also have sort of 
seen a significant market failure in Kenya, given that we have almost universal access with the PESA, um, it would be not fair to say that we've seen tremendous innovations in the fintech space uh, all over the place. I mean, it's a tricky space. It's a highly regulated space. Um, but I think we can do better. Right? It's not just in PESA. It's also Equita and other things that are really in the on the sort of hardcore banking and telecom side. But I think on the entrepreneurial side, uh, everyone feels there is potentially sort of a tipping point for the industry. And so there's more and more pressure to be part of in the hope of being part of that. Agribusiness, I think, very similarly so. It's been um, an industry that has been struggling for a long time, but now with technology, um, you know, areas such as logistics and, and um, you know, being, bringing farmers closer to the market, um, et cetera, are booming and people seeing an opportunity to play in those spaces. So I think these are two areas which I see as the majority of the trend of what's happening today. And I think that's also reflected in both the people that we incubate as well as the people that hang out there doing new stuff. What are you finding? Is it at the stage where um, companies are beginning to sort of copy each other, or, or you're, you're kind of you're sat down, you're listening to a pitch, and you're like, "Oh, I've kind of heard this one before," or is it still at the stage of there's enough sort of open territory that people are, are finding their own place? There's a lot of. Uh, it's it's already at a point where I see a lot of um, uh, sort of healthy competition. Right? You do something that somebody else has already done, even you know, because it's a big enough market. Right. So if you're in the renewable energy space and you know you want to compete with whatever and COPA as a solution, you can. The market is big enough. There's room for more than one player. The fintech space, there's room for more than one player. So I think people see that and it just becomes like in any other part of the world, you know. You try to be first first to the market, gain first mover advantage and then make it harder for the next one to succeed. Um, so I see some of that already, not to the scale as it is in mature economies, but um, I do see a good amount of overlap. Does, uh, does I help invest in any of these? I mean, is it, or is it just the incubation program? Is that when you're hearing these pitches, is it for the incubation? No, we reinvest. So, so we uh, support ourselves um, Right now, almost in a not-for-profit mode, especially on the community side, right? On the consultancy side, you know, the community strategy for us, we call this now connect. And what used to be sort of on the consultancy side, we call it build. And on the connect side, we, we typically get input from the outside with a specific purpose of engaging, connecting with startups. Um, some of our incubation programs um, are also sort of money that we get with the purpose of investing in the startup. So we don't actually um, do any, we don't take equity investments. We don't, uh, we don't take a cut of anything. As um, what makes a good pitch in your opinion? Um, well, be very specific about what problem you are trying to solve. Uh, be very clear on who is the customer who is going to buy what you are building and at least have a sense of how much money you can actually make over what period of time. You found that people here are good at pitching or do they still need some help? Well, let me... I think... Um, I, I think that it's a, a more loaded question, right? I mean, because uh, it's 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 neither black or white, right? I think that there is a. You also have to look. I'll give you an outsider perspective, right? I mean, given that I used to work for a large corporate when I came here, um, I was always astounded to hear about a lot of the ideas that were being pitched, which were actually more, I would call them, sort of in the social enterprise space, right? So people wanted to make a difference and all that kind of stuff, right? There's nothing wrong with that, but I've seen a shift over the last four years where people are getting business art. Right? People are trying to find ways to make money um, on 
problems that are relevant to enterprises, problems that are relevant to consumers, um, addressing you know some potentially societal challenges, but the focus is really on making money. So that changes the perspective of how you pitch things, right? Um, a good pitch doesn't necessarily make you a investment ready company either, right? So you need to make sure that you were not smoking something funny. You need to make sure that your your technology actually works, right? that you're not over uh, and in, in, into your technology and all of a sudden figure out that it's actually way too hard for you to deliver that. Right? So, um, so I would say, do people present themselves in the right way? Sure. I mean, there is still a lot of help that I think people can use here in terms of their pitching quality or in terms of how people give presentations. Um, I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the biggest problem that I think we need to address. Right? I think there are many more aspects to getting nascent entrepreneurs into fundable entrepreneurs uh, than just pitch them. What do you see some of those being? Well, there, there are a couple of things. So there's again, you know, it comes down for me to, you know, basic business hygiene, right? So um, appreciating the difference between um, revenue and cost sounds really simple, but you kind of have to think through this a little bit and then really understand what this is about and make sure you know how to run a lead shop, right? Uh, don't get overexcited and spending money. Um, be frugal in whatever you do and be focused, maniacally focused on what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think reinforcing that but also helping uh, startups to connect, uh, to correct, uh, course correct as they're working through this in the way and how they're setting up, I think is one of the important uh, things. Um, the other thing is also I care a lot about, um, about leadership and leadership styles, how people um, not just present themselves, but how people project what is what is key to them. You know what they are passionate about, how much they want to invest their own lives into getting certain things. Right? Um, that is a highly underestimated aspect, I think, especially in sort of the emerging markets environment. And um, and when I compare this with India, where a lot of these things actually work quite well these days, um, India has also benefited. Uh, tremendously from a reverse brain drain, um, which you don't necessarily see here all the time. The other thing is, um, you know, one of the trickiest things in Africa is scale. If you are a fintech, your market is the Kenyan market. Your market may not be Uganda because you have 55 regulators on the continent, right? That's different from having a country with 1.2 billion people and one regulator. Right, um, the regulator may put a lot of, you know, kind of things in your way that may not make you scale as easily. But at the end of the day, it's one regulator. Here, it's much harder. Right? So, how do you help people to think about scale upfront and also do their solution design, scale and build? I think that is going to be one of the biggest challenges to figure out here on the continent. And, um, are you? I mean, it, do you think that is just a, that will be an, an inherent blocker to scalable businesses here? Do you think they will forever be kind of capped due to these um, the sort of factors that you such as lots of regulation, or do you think that's something which people can work around? Well, I think it's um, you know, a people can work around potentially if you want to. Um, the second thing is also. You know, one also need to understand that, of course, the regional politics and, and economics hopefully will always go in your favor as well. Right? I mean, the Eastern Africa, the Eastern African integration, cross integration across East, West, and Southern Africa. Um, I think, I hope, or my hopes are that the governance will eventually become more conducive to trade. And that that will ease up a lot of barriers as well, right? Um, for whatever we think about the European Union, um, for whatever challenges one may have, um, we see with Brexit right now what kind of consequences it 
have as well, and that there are some aspects of the European Union that have existed way before we actually used to talk about them, right? Um, that from a trade perspective made the European Union a tremendously um, sort of powerful and competitive ent uh, entity, right? So one could question, do you, do you need the same currency, right? But do you need trade barriers that are conducive to trade? Absolutely, right? So I, I, I have hopes that, uh, especially with Kenya's leadership, that a lot of these things will get better and make uh, the environment more conducive uh, to business. But I think at this point in time, the focus on each of the individual regions, and maybe Rwanda has played a, a leadership role on this, um, even ahead of Kenya, uh, in terms of how easy is it to start a business. And how easy is it to start a business in Kenya? Um, well, the the best indicators that you have right now is the World Bank ranking. Right? So in the last ranking, Kenya was now in the sort of middle third, right? Um, probably more uh, this year. But um, I realistically think is that it's still hard, right? It's still not as easy as it should be. Right. Um, but I think with a lot of the regulations that have been presented, a lot of the la laws that have been passed over the last uh, two years, um, that over time those things will get better. And over time, meaning in the next year to two, I do think we will see a more or easier to manage environment for businesses to start up. Um, what hasn't been addressed yet is, you know, what are areas or what, what was the impact of taxation on entrepreneurial growth? Um, how do special economic zones that came through last year um, affect the entrepreneurial, especially in the ICT space? Um, there, there, there's still a lot more to do. Um, there's, I think, still a lot more um, advice that we as a community have to give to the government in terms of how do you actually support especially the entrepreneurial economy, right? But on the other hand, if you think about other countries, right, um, think about India, which has always been, let's say, a decade ahead in terms of the industrial development of ICT, um, all the, the, the governmental startup support in India has literally just started last year. Right, make in India is kind of the new slogan of India, and it's not like it has been around for 10 years. It's, it's, a, it's a very recent development, and in that sense, also nascent development. Uh, but in India, you're less dependent on the government to begin with versus in a much smaller country like Kenya. So, um, but I'm actually hopeful. I, I do believe that the government here is taking steps in the right directions. Are they enough? No. Um, but at least something is happening that will make it much, much easier over the next few years. And, um, <clears throat> and when you sort of look forward over the next three to five years in, in, in Kenya, um, what, does, what do you think the overall business environment will look like uh, in terms of which sectors will be doing well? Uh, and also, what, you know, what will iHub's role be within that? Um, well, I'm not an economist, right? So, and, and you never know, right? Because we, you know, the natural resources sector and, um, sort of the, uh, is, is still unclear how that is going to play out. That may have a, and, and the way how the government might respond to sort of usable production of crude oil, um, or other minerals, um, will determine a lot about the future of Kenya. Right now, I think we have the blessing of no natural resources, right? Which means um, it's a, it's a, it's actually a relatively stable, diversified economy, right? Um, so it's it's hard to predict, and you know, sector picking is always very hard. You hope that the industrial sector will pick up uh, manufacturing. I mean, we just had. Uh, car companies coming into Kenya to manufacture here. Uh, that is, I think, a very, very exciting step. 
Um, I think, for example, what you know, as part of the IHUB ecosystem here, what uh, Gearbox is doing to to support skills development in skills related to manufacturing, also into modern manufacturing, uh, could be huge if Kenya sort of grows steadily in, in those spaces. Um, the the fintech space, of course, is important, and I think there's a lot of consolidation that will happen um, over the next few years. Um, I, there is a lot of hope. And I think in agriculture, it's almost like a necessity, right? I mean, we need to get to a more productive way of producing. Um, we need to become a more stable sort of agricultural sector. And a lot of the work that's happening here in the, the broader ecosystem in agribusiness, I think, could, could potentially really revolutionize the way how we think about it. Um, so, and success will have followers, will have people investing more into these spaces, right? Um, the role of the IHUB for me is we want to help and be sort of pivotal in this environment for, for especially early stage startups, for, for making startups more investable, um, for, as I said, to create people to, to generate that convening power also from a governance perspective, especially focusing with early businesses, with new businesses, startup businesses, um, and, and drive more investments into the ecosystem. But what we need to do is we need to prove we can actually do that. We can actually find mechanisms to create sort of startups that investors are willing to invest into. And that is going to be the longer term transformation for us. But, you know, I would like to have the IHUD be part or participant in, in the economic growth of Kenya, to be a participant in creating more jobs, not necessarily touch millions of people's of lives or anything, but actually just create more jobs. And um, I'm assuming at the moment, um, who are the people that are investing? Um, and who do you think, and, and why, are, why are more people not investing? I mean, I think the you know the usual VCs um, know that there are I mean, there there are investment companies um, that are investing. There is still a tremendous interest in it. Right? Uh, look, we you know what's an investor, right? I mean, an investor is somebody who wants to have a return, and um, we haven't seen sort of um, a, a a significant percentage of um, of big returns or substantial returns that are sort of congruent with the typical risks that investors take. So, um, you know, am I surprised that you don't have the same kind of investments here that you may have in Europe or even in India? No, because, you know, if I were an investor, I would be uh, more skeptical as well. But, you know, I mean, we have an investor into the IM as well. And um, and these guys, I think, they have a very clear view on the strength of the brand and the prospects of the IHUB. Um, and part of my job is also to work with them to make sure that we stabilize the IHUB business posture, but at the same time become even more relevant to the community because over time, right, I think there are many adjacent effects that the IHUB can have from a business returns perspective even for our investors, right? So, so I, I think it's you know I actually don't see that so much as I don't think of it as so dramatic, right? What I think is that you know we need to prove that we can create you know bankable businesses, right? And if we have created bankable businesses, then I don't I, I think it's um, it's not a chicken and an It's really you create bankable businesses people will come and invest into it. And they will invest into more so that they can balance the risk. Um, so we'll just have a few more questions, if that's okay. Um, so you said that you've been in this role as CEO for about sort of two and a half, three months. Um, have there been any particular surprises that you've had in this time? 
Uh, yeah, the, the, the biggest surprise uh, that uh, I had is that I was not aware of how strong the brand of the island is and how many people globally, I'm not talking about Kenya, probably Kenyans are the biggest critics uh, of the island. But if I go be if I if I if I leave Kenya, which I do on a regular basis, or if I talk to people outside in the United States and and in Europe, or if I look at how many visitors are coming in. Uh, yesterday we had a Finnish delegation here, we had a Swedish very high profile delegation here. We had um, before that uh, folks from Japan, from Italy, from you name it, right? I mean, it's the, 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 there is so much interest, and there is also, you know, what strikes me is, you know, I try to write regular blog posts to report about, you know, where we stand. I've been, um, you know, I've been delinquent last week, so I have to do it sometime over the weekend. But part of my reasoning is that, um, you know, I want a document of what my thought process is communicate to which direction I'm going. And it's really interesting how often I meet somebody who I haven't met before from anywhere in the world says, oh, I've read your blog post. I'm like, really? You know, it's like, and and so, so that just took me by surprise. I mean, how many people know about us is one thing, but how many people actually genuinely care, like who really are rooting for us, who, who want to see how we are doing, you know, who are offering help, um, who are helping us with ideas or connections. Um, and, and that is just tremendous. Right? I mean, for a small organization that we are, right, in Kenya, right, um, to get that level of excitement and, and also support, um, I thought that um, that made me rethink who we actually are. That made me rethink about the value and the stature of the IHUB and also kind of what the responsibility for me and my team to really bring it into a next level that um, exceeds the expectations of those who are moving forward. Now, for fear of um, swarming you with more interest, how can people listening at home read up and, and hear about what I have is up to? Um, just do what I have. <laughs> it will it, it, be the first thing that will show up. And uh, so we, we published quite a few blog posts, uh, not just mine, but a lot of others here. Uh, we blog a lot about what's happening, um, what events there are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, with, with our change, we are also in the process of kind of changing our website and Sort of streamlining those along the lines of our new strategy or future strategy. Um, but in principle, there's a wealth of information about the IHAP. Um, um, and then, of course, also just Google around um, to read about the criticisms about the IHAP and also the challenges that people are seeing with the IHAP. Um, I unfortunately don't remember the particular blog author's name. Um, but there was a very critical article about the IHUB, and uh, the most interesting piece about that particular blog post, if you find it, was that it meant to be critical, but it listed out all the startups that actually touched the IHUB at some point, or a lot of them, and some of them very prominent. And and I felt the author tried to make a critical case about the IHUB, but really, in my mind, achieved the opposite. Because it showed, you know, oh, all of these people, you know, it's the mother of our ecosystems and all that, right? So, um, so a little bit of Googling is a wealth of information about the IHUB, and, you know, we are always, if any of your listeners are ever in Nairobi, just come check out our answer. We're probably moving to Kingston, and um, um, it will be always very easy to find us. Well, come on. Thank you so much. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes of this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast and then searching for the episode title. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. Now, a few people have got in touch and have been asking about how this podcast came about. And well, it all started when I took a one-way flight to Rwanda to seek out business opportunities across the region. I'm now at the stage of formulating a bit of a plan of the business I want to go into based on all of these podcast interviews and will be keeping a record of what I get up to on my blog. And so if you're interested in being kept in the loop, you can sign up to the newsletter there.
Again, it's samfloy.com. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the podcast, or indeed anything, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com, and I'd be very happy to chat. In any case, have a great week, and speak to you soon.